Good morning, afternoon, or evening, depending on what time you're watching this. My name's Connor from 905 Review. You guys are checking out our series, Give This a Spin, where I recommend you some of my favorite albums. Today we're looking at another historic release, being jazz legend Miles Davis's Kind of Blue. Miles Davis was born just outside St. Louis in 1926, and it came as no surprise that he would pursue music, given that his mother was a music teacher. The surprise, however, was that she preferred the violin, whereas trumpet would become Davis's favorite thing, receiving his first as a gift at age nine. And Miles was becoming so good and invested at trumpet that even when Tiny Bradshaw's band was passing through St. Louis, they invited him to join on for the rest of the tour, though his mother wouldn't let him as she wanted him to finish high school first. And this bothered him so much, he didn't speak to her for two whole weeks. Miles may have felt like his best opportunity in music just passed him by, but he was in luck because another chance was just around the corner. Billy Eckstein was coming through St. Louis with a phenomenal band behind him that included Art Blakey, Dizzy Gillespie, and Charlie Parker. And wouldn't you know it, Buddy Anderson, the band's trumpet player, was too sick to perform, so in came this wide-eyed 18-year-old who never looked back. And playing with these cats, Miles realized that New York was really the place for him to be. He enrolled in the Juilliard School of Music there, though would skip numerous classes and eventually dropped out after three semesters in favor of actually going out and playing, but on top of that, he felt what they were teaching was just too much white European music. So he would continue playing in New York and with some of the biggest names in the scene, Kenny Clark, Thelonious Monk, and Charles Mingus among them. By 1947, Davis had already become a band leader, and there were many highs and lows that followed this. Among them were experimenting, really pushing jazz's boundaries, and dropping the drugs he was doing and going vegan after seeing how it tore apart Charlie Parker's band, which he was a part of but soon left. Aside from a performance with the Tad Dameron Quintet at the Paris International Jazz Festival in 1949, work started to become scarce for Miles, who began falling behind on his hotel rent, on his car payments, and, to make matters worse, became addicted to heroin. He would begin churning out multiple albums in quick succession to help fund this, but by 1954 he got himself clean, already having lived quite a full life at only 27 years old. So he would continue to just put out tons of albums, but now this was coming from a more passionate place. He cared a lot more about it, always willing to experiment, and change up what he was doing. It was at the point where he had accomplished so much he considered retiring at age 30 as he had been offered to teach at Harvard. But he decided to press on and in the spring of 1959 with 27 albums already under his belt he decided it was time for another and with quite the impressive supporting lineup. You had Cannonball Adderley on alto sax, John Coltrane on tenor sax, Paul Chambers on bass, James Cobb on drums, and Wyndon Kelly on piano, though he only appeared on one track as Davis was interested in getting pianist Bill Evans in on this. This was due to Davis and Evans' shared interest in George Russell's pioneering of modal jazz, being music based more so around modes, where notes don't have the same purpose or function as they do in tonal music, and therefore eliminating chord progression. So with all that rambling out of the way, let's finally get into the music. Let's finally see what this Miles Davis guy is all about, right? The album opens off with its first track, So What? And it takes all of about five seconds to see where Kind of Blue gets its name from, with a very mellow bass and piano opening. But before long, the band gets into the swing of things, creating this nice little groove, and things don't exactly seem blue anymore, more so chill. <laughs> Miles proceeds to solo away over this nice little mood we have set for ourselves. Before allowing his saxophonist time in the spotlight as well. It might be my single favorite Miles Davis tune and an all-time classic jazz song. 
Following this is Freddie Freeloader, the lone track with Wyndon Kelly on piano. Nobody for sure knows the inspiration of the song's title as many reputable people have different beliefs on it, but the one allegation that it comes from a popular bartender who had a business card calling himself Freddie Freeloader on it, that seems quite fitting given the song's mood. I mean, this is definitely something that I would picture in like a nice classy lounge or club back in these days. And I picture chilling here at a table with the boys, dressed all nice, playing some cards, live band playing this up front, and probably a cloud of smoke over the whole place. Once again, Davis and his saxophones all get an opportunity to solo here. Very classy tune, can't go wrong with this one. And closing the first side of the album is the pained, heartfelt blue and green. The piano and bass do such a great job setting that mood while Davis doubles down contributing further. It is an absolute despair here, but there certainly is a weight to be felt. And this song feels very deserving to be in a noir film, like I should be some detective doing a monologue over it. That gal really was something. And though she left me here behind, I was on to her. I had the feeling we'd be crossing paths again. Really, the only downside is that this track is too short. I mean, sure, it's five and a half minutes long, but I could listen to this go on for much longer and consider that every other song on here is at least nine and a half minutes. Opening the second side a little more frantically is all blues. And that piano just adds such a sense of suspense to it. Don't you think? And like, the saxophone and trumpet somewhat do as well, but kind of more helping in like an ominous way on their own. Which is funny because once they drop that piano out, it actually feels like quite the smooth tune, but then they bring it back in and back comes this anxiety with it. And despite being called all blues, it doesn't feel all that down to me, to be honest. I, as stated, I get more of a sense of A, anxiety, or B, a relieving feeling once that piano drops out into a more supporting role. Because I mean, just listen to that saxophone go. And so closing our album today is the fifth track, Flamenco Sketches. It begins with some very soft trading between the piano and bass before Davis and the drums join on in. And it is so very peaceful to say the least. I just picture floating on the water, kicking back, eyes closed as the sun begins to set. Things feel a little more serious when the saxophone chimes in, but everything eventually settles itself as the piano calms us back down. Kind of Blue is available on all major formats, but you might be lucky enough to have one of many different international releases from back in the day. The original Japanese release had its own separate artwork, as did New Zealand and Europe together, and the Dutch did as well in 1964. On top of that, all releases in 1987 had yet another cover on them. Kind of Blue was remastered in 1992 as the original recording speed apparently caused the first side to be somewhat off pitch, so in 1995, there was a double record release, one of the album as is, the other with the remastered first side on one side and a previously unheard take of flamenco sketches on the other. In 2002, the album was released on a lucrative 180 gram blue vinyl limited to only 100 copies. In 2004, there were separate CD and DVD packs that you could find, one containing the documentary The Miles Davis Story, the other containing a 
making of the album and its impact. In 2008, a box set was released in celebration of the album's 50th anniversary. This had the album on a blue vinyl, on CD, a second CD just containing other 50s Miles Davis sextet hits, as well as a DVD documentary and pictures. These CDs and DVDs would later be available for purchase on their own and Interestingly enough, in Portugal, could even come with a free t-shirt. In 2008, there was a Supreme edition, which I really didn't expect, and from this point on, tons of other versions with their own unique covers. While there was also a number of specialty vinyl releases, these would all be on either clear or a variety of different blues, with the exception of a 2021 European release on red, limited to only 500 copies. I'm not going to dance around it. Kind of Blue is considered... Among the finest jazz albums ever made, and even among the greatest albums ever regardless of genre. It's been called the greatest jazz album of all time. Rolling Stone called it a top 15 album of all time. When the National Recording Registry was founded in 2000 to recognize and preserve the most significant pieces of audio throughout human history, this was one of the 50 inaugural inductions, and it wasn't even limited to albums. I mean, I've covered a lot of albums. I've listened to significantly more albums. I don't know if I've ever seen something this unanimous. And I mean, it's influenced tons of artists, like regardless of genre. I think the highest praise I found for it was rapper Q-Tip of the group A Tribe Called Quest, comparing it to the Bible in the sense that he believed everyone should have one in their house. Miles was absolutely on on this record, and, you know, having such a quality talented backing band only helps them. I mean, it's no surprise all these guys had their own individual success. And as impressive as all its reviews and accolades are, to me, nothing's more impressive than the fact it was all recorded in only nine hours. I mean, if that doesn't speak to these guys' level of talent, I don't know what will. Now, it is worth noting this album had some controversy that caught me by surprise. Bill Evans, the pianist brought on for this album, claims some songwriting credits on Kind of Blue, but predominantly on the third track, Blue and Green. Some people who are much more well-versed in jazz than I could even suspect that just from hearing it, so it's really not that far-fetched to claim. But that's despite it only being credited to Davis on the album, and even Evans re-recording it for his own album the following year had to give Davis credits on that. Bill never wanted to make a huge deal out of it, but, I mean, come on, at the very least... Miles Davis could have split the royalties with him, right? And he did. He wrote him a check for $25. As much as that blows, I'm just here to grade the album. So go show Bill Evans some love, but Kind of Blue does get an A plus grading. I mean, it's considered the best jazz album out there by many, and really it is hard to dispute that. It's an incredibly consistent listen. I would say all these songs are great. You know, I already talked about what a great group of musicians it is on this thing. Um, I really like Davis's format where usually they'll establish the song, he'll solo, the two saxophone players will solo, and sometimes even Bill getting an opportunity to shine as well. Some more praise I saw for it that I really have to agree with. The album is a great entryway into jazz for somebody who doesn't listen to it, but on top of that, I mean, there's so much here that even jazz aficionados will surely appreciate. Those have been my thoughts on Miles Davis and his group's Kind of Blue. Let me know yours. I always appreciate you watching this, and maybe you'll stick around for another. You take care. Until next time. But real quick before we take off, I'm asking you, what were your thoughts on Miles Davis's Kind of Blue? Did I rate it too high? That's the only option. <laughs> you let me know if my rating was on the dot, if it was too high, if you have any other thoughts or comments, even if you have any other albums you want me to check out. Anyways, it's been a slice. Loved hosting you, and until next time. I am all business. <laughs>